morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Pop quiz. Find out, find out how many brethren devotions yesterday. I would like somebody to explain to me, speaking Episcopal logically. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody stop to look it up? those things on you and you kind of scratch your head and go, huh? But overall, um, I love how he gets to the place where he makes you think and hopefully uh, you are uh, doing that as you go through. There's a few things to announce to you today. Uh, first of all, we're going to be sending a clipboard through the congregation. It is inviting you to be liturgists and ushers and things like that. So as the clipboard goes through, um, we encourage you to help us uh, out in those areas in the coming weeks, okay? After the service is over this morning, um, I need two guys, uh, after the table is cleared off, to take the table and to bring it over here on the side uh, so that we have it out of the way for the concert this afternoon. So if someone would make sure that gets done, I would appreciate it. As you see in the bulletin, um, we have several things going on. Uh, the Congregational Life Team will meet on Tuesday. Um, and then the, the choir concert this afternoon. I'm asking you for a favor on this. This is, this is important to us um, as a church. Um, we're hoping that over time um, we can uh, do this for our community as a, a means of of uh, promoting uh, fine arts, which I think is really important. Um, if you could, uh, would you make plans to be here this afternoon uh, for the concert? Uh, they have uh, gone out of their way to work with us and to uh, go over uh, all the details with us, uh, to adapt and to adjust uh, for us. And uh, I'm just excited about what they will be presenting. And so as a congregation, uh, I'm just asking if you would, uh, please support it. Um, and then hopefully our community will as well. But our church needs to support that um, uh, even more so than our community uh, does. So that's kind of, I guess, the favor I'm asking. I, it shouldn't be like sacrificial or anything. Um, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be like you're coming here and going to get beat up or tortured or something like that. It should be a delightful, delightful afternoon, okay? Now, if you take and open your bulletins, I want to go through our services because we are at the first Sunday of Lent. And um, so our services are going to change up. And um, I want to take you through some of those changes. Um, First of all, I, I want to point out to you that when we get to the call of confession, the call of confession, uh, for the entire season of Lent, we are eliminating um, uh, weekly psalms, and we are replacing it with Psalm 51, okay? Psalm 51 is the penitential prayer of David upon being uh, convicted of his sin. And so what you will see each week is we will use that psalm as the outline for our confession. So our liturgist, Julie, this morning, she will be reading parts of the psalm. And then our response to that um, reading would be our response as people uh, uh, filling in uh, what the psalmist is uh, declaring before God. All right. So that will be the same every week. Um, and that's, that's important to know. You will also know, notice that there before the confession um, and after the confession, there is a chorus. It's a very, very easy chorus. Um, and we will be singing that because we are going to focus throughout the season of Lent on God's merciful and God's uh, mercy and God's grace. 
And so I'm going to ask Connie, if she would, just to play the melody line of that. There, it is in your insert, and you can follow along with it there, but it's very, very easy. And so Connie, if you would, uh, play that so everybody can hear it. So would you join me in singing that? <clears throat> The Lord is kind and merciful. Very easy, okay? So we will have that each week. That will be a part of our service. If you will go uh, over to uh, the proclaiming of God's word, we will change it up through Lent, and each week we will be reading all of the assigned scriptures for that Sunday. So we'll be getting a little heavier dose of the, uh, the scriptures during that time, and you'll see how the people that set up the lectionary bring the text together so that they support one another. So we'll begin that today. And then also notice that after we sing our responsive hymn, rather than the Apostles' Creed, we will be doing a responsive prayer. And that prayer is a declaration of what we have come to know and to believe about God and God's goodness, okay? And so that will be a weekly part of what we are doing. Everything else should flow as normal, okay? Uh, we don't wanna, uh, 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 we're not changing everything up, but those things are particular to Lent, and the focus is to get us to focus on Lent being a special time uh, for our worship. Uh, we will have communion today, and that will follow as being normal. And uh, Sandy, we are not taking home communion out, right? Or are we? Okay. Sherry is? Sherry is celebrating a birthday. Wednesday. So like 69? <laughs> Maybe a little more than that? Congratulations. Okay. I would ask you to just take a moment, pause, and quiet yourself uh, for the beginning of our service. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. Pilgrims and strangers in this world, in this season of Lent, we are invited to journey. We walk with Jesus wherever he leads us. Disciples of Jesus, in this season of Lent, we are invited to follow our Master to the cross in love and forgiveness. We will lay our cross and follow Believers in God, in this season of Lent, we are invited to trust the Lord who proves himself faithful. Children of our Heavenly Father, we are invited into this place to worship. The living Christ is with us. Would you join me and let us pray together?
morning. morning. Our call to confession. The psalmist shows us what a heart that is contrite looks like. In Psalms 51, we see a powerful example of contrition over sin and expectation for forgiveness. Today, we join with David in confession before God. Today's prayer confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Your mercy is what we long for. Your steadfast love sustains us. Only you can cleanse us. Only through Jesus Christ we are restored to wholeness. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Oh my God, in your presence we confess our shortcomings and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and forgetting you at all. Mighty God, we repent in spirit and in truth, admit our sin, and graciously receive your forgiveness, Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Mercy of God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too severe. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us future in which you can change, and grant us grace to be more and more in your likeness and image. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. My God, we confess before you the evil of our hearts. We acknowledge that we are too inclined toward anger, jealousy, and revenge, towards ambition and pride. We are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal us. us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. In your mercy, forgive me what we have been. Help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Heart, soul, and voice, we declare that you are Lord our God. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Certain of this truth, we know that God hears our confessions, and on Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Please share God's peace with one another. Good morning.
leather cannon wall. <laughs> Our first scripture reading to us this morning comes to us from Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And finally, the reading for our text this morning comes to us from Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for indeed was, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, it was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more they have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for judgment followed one trespass, and it brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that were read. Help us now as we talk about them. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand the things that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's interesting, again, the passages that are assigned for this first week of Lent. The Old Testament reading is about God speaking to Adam and Eve and laying out the parameters for human life as it is to be lived before God, forbidding them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, in the well-known account, we understand that through the temptation, they in fact did eat. And there were consequences that flowed out from that. The second reading in the book of Matthew is about Jesus in the midst of the wilderness and three times being tempted in a similar fashion that Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden. And on three occasions, Jesus overcomes the temptation. He is faithful in the midst of temptation. And so you see one hand, the problem, and you see Jesus on the other side being the solution. And then when we get to the book of Romans that we just read, Paul is looking back at those two things, and he's talking about Adam, and he's talking about Jesus and how they play off of one another. <clears throat> I was thinking this week as I was encountering the text, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, it's been amazing to watch how the power of one person can change the world forever. How many of you remember life before McDonald's? Ray, Cl Ray Kroc had a dream that people should be able to go to a place to eat and not have to wait to be served, that they should be able to just walk up. And remember back when McDonald's first started, there were just rows and rows of hamburgers and cheeseburgers and everything else. And, and the, you know, the unfortunate thing was, if you got in line behind somebody who says, I don't want pickles on my hamburger, what happened? It threw a monkey wrench at everything. Everybody had to stand there and wait as a special order went in, right? Ray Kroc changed life for everyone. All of the restaurants that have sprung up as a result of that, people go to fast food places more than any other place. We eat on the go, we eat in our cars, we, we take things home and we eat at the house. All of those things are a result of the change that one man brought to our world. I don't know that's a good change, by the way. <laughs> Think about Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft. He literally imposed a computerized generation, a computerized world upon this generation. I was working in a Christian bookstore as I was planting a church and I needed additional income. And the store was one of those stores that had index cards or, or inventory cards in every book that we sold, every item that we had, and we kept those, and that's how we reordered. That was the system. At the end of the day, all of those cards, then we'd place those on a written order, we'd fax that order in, or we'd speak over the phone for that order. And I never will forget, we got a computer. It was a big old massive beast. And in that computer, we entered every item in the store. And when it sold, it automatically gave us a report on what sold. It was a miracle. All of the self-induced inventory work was suddenly gone. And about that time, every time somebody would use a charge card, we would have to pick up the phone, call it in, read the numbers over the phone, get an approval number, fill out the little slip, go kerchunk on it and have the person sign it, and then turn those into the bank. I never will forget about the time we got the computer, we also got a machine 
that you could just put, slide that thing in the machine and it did all of the things for you. Computers have totally changed our lives. One man changed the way everybody lives. Our world is completely dependent on computers. Completely dependent upon computers. You realize that if there was a computer malfunction worldwide, our world would, would cease to operate. You can't fly a plane anywhere. You can't have traffic lights anywhere. You can't have anything that you just accept for being normal without computers. One man changed everything. And think about Jeff Bezos. He said, I think that people would rather sit in their homes and they would rather order items from their home and have them shipped directly to their homes rather than to go out and spend entire days shopping. I think that I could start a business whereby people will flock to it and I can offer certain things to them that will encourage them to buy through me. Billions of dollars later, one man changed the world. It used to be, I, I remember Julie and I having to go out and multiple times to get Christmas items for all the people in our lives. Shopping and looking and hunting and this store didn't have it so you go to that store and then after a while I said, I've had enough of this, you do all of that. And then she would do it. This year, she did it from the couch and everything was shipped directly to our home. Free shipping. One man has changed the whole world. In the next 10 to 15 years, the whole retail industry will be drastically changed and most of the stand-alone stores, most of the stores that you see, probably will be forced out of business as everybody goes to online shopping only. One man changed the world. Paul sets before us the reality of how one man changed everything. The whole entire world was changed, Paul says, through the con and the consequences as a result of one man's sin. He's about to embark on a discussion, and the discussion just simply has to do with questions we all ask ourselves. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do. I know I do all the time. Why is it that I do things that are wrong? Many times I don't want to do that, but I do them anyway. Many times I want to do things that are right, but I never get around to it. We ask the questions, why do we do destructive things? Why do we say some of the things that we say? Why do we hurt the ones that we love the most? Why is it that we hate people who aren't like us? Why is it that we envy those who have more than us? Why is it that there's always been wars in humanity? Why is it that wars prevail throughout history? There's always wars going on, always bickering going on, always strife going on. There's always injustice, always greed, always people taking advantage of others. Why? <laughs> Paul says it's because through one man, the whole world was changed. Adam. Paul tells us that through birth we are contaminated through the actions of one person. Think of it as the coronavirus that gets transmitted from one person to another, one generation to another. There's no vaccine for it, it can't be stopped. It just takes over the whole globe. There's no denying it, there's no keeping it at bay. Eventually, everyone succumbs to the virus. Paul says, Adam is responsible for that. 
We share a deep, unavoidable connection, an identity with Adam. His one act of disobedience, Paul says, set in motion sin. And when sin was set in motion, it resulted in death. And when death was set in motion, it set in motion judgment. And when judgment was set in motion, it resulted in condemnation. It's universal. There's no escape from it. There's no one who is sinless. Through the actions of one person, Paul says, humanity was lost. There's a distinction that the scriptures make that I think is important for us. There is, there is the use in the text as you read them and, and as you think about it of sin, S-I-N. And then there is on the other hand the distinction of sins, S-I-N-S. One is a plural, one is a singular. We always think in terms of sins, individual acts of failure. Oops, I said something bad today. Oops, I just did something wrong. Oops, I ate something that I wasn't supposed to. Oops, I saw something that I wasn't supposed to see. But that's, those sins are an outworking of something that's much bigger than that. Why is it that we do that? Paul said it has to do with this idea of sin, S-I-N, singular. That is a corporate or a systemic failure. It is a systemic influences that destroys everything, that mars everything, harms and degrades everything, abuses and discriminates in every way. Sin is the big canopy that we are housed under. Sins are the result of living in that residence. Paul, in most of his stuff, is dealing with sin. What Adam gave to us, one man changing the world, has to do with a big picture, a canopy that's been placed over everyone. That canopy brings everyone into sin and death. But Paul wants us to know that there's also a similar process that brings a healing to the virus. It brings people into a place, rather than judgment, a place of righteousness. The entire remedy, Paul says, is in one person. Paul says it is in Jesus Christ. One man, Adam, one man, Jesus. One man, Adam, disobeys. One man, Jesus, obeys. One man, Adam, rebels against God. One man, Jesus, submits to God and is faithful to God. One man, Adam, brings sin and death and destruction. One man, Jesus, brings righteousness, peace, and joy. They are set up to be polar opposites of one another. It's why you see Jesus in the wilderness. He is facing the task that Adam and Eve faced in the garden in order to pass it with flying colors. One act of righteousness, one act of obedience, Paul says, brings a remedy that we receive by grace. That remedy is offered to everyone. It is an option that we have. It is a call or an invitation that we have to break free from the virus that Adam produced over the entire world. Paul argues as he moves on in his epistle that we don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. We can participate in goodness. We can act in deeds of faithfulness. We can demonstrate compassion and forgiveness and mercy to others, all because God, by grace, has given to us Jesus Christ. The remedy is given by grace. It's there. God does it. The same way as God, by grace, created. God, by grace, bequeathed the earth with the necessary ingredients to be sustaining. We had nothing to say about it. God did that. The remedy is there 
because of God's grace. The remedy is there because it's empowered by God's Spirit. As we respond to that remedy, as we respond to that grace, and the Spirit of God begins to take over our lives, we begin to experience something called obedience to God. I find very little difference between the offer of grace and the response of obedience. Some people put those diametrically opposed as if obedience is somehow we're going to destroy the idea of grace. We can't be obedient without God's grace. We can't be obedient without God's spirit. But God has given us his grace. God has given us his spirit. Therefore, we are empowered. We are enabled through Jesus Christ to be obedient. And God looks at our obedience. And God is pleased by it. God offers us the power to break free. God offers us the power to live a different way. God offers us the power to look beyond death. Everything that came through Adam is undone now in Christ. But I find something disturbing in our culture. Allow me just for a second just to air one of the things that deeply, deeply pains me. Rather than a people who stare at death, rather than being a people who recognize our helplessness in light of death, rather than being a people who admit our contributions towards death, rather than being a people who understand and acknowledge that through Adam death reigns, rather than being a people who squarely engage with death and then see beyond it to the resurrection of Jesus and his triumph over it, we just kind of skirt around death. We get glimpses of it here and there, but we don't really deal with it. The trend in the last 10 years in funerals is memorial services that sometimes are held three, four, five, six months, a year later after the person has died. Rather than just an acknowledgement that here is death, it is okay to grieve that death. We just say, okay, the person's passed on, life goes on, and then someday, we'll get around to remembering. Funerals have become more of a celebration of life than they are a recognition of death and a call to remember the remedy to death. We go to funerals to feel good about life rather than to confront death and look beyond it. I just went to a, a funeral of a colleague. Not one mention was made of the gospel and the resurrection. The entire funeral was just a litany of people telling stories about my friend. Funny stories, we laughed. But it was almost an acknowledgement that my friend is still living on, still with us, as we remember. My friend is gone. He has left deposits in my life that I will treasure forever, but he is gone. He has died. And he awaits the remedy to death, the resurrection. I find that disturbing, and I have minister colleagues everywhere who are lamenting the idea, the pressure to do to funerals, which was the pressure that was put upon ministers to do to weddings 20 years ago to make them social extravagant events rather than a covenantal exchange of vows before God. It's all happening right before us because we are a culture that does not want to be confronted with death. We no longer slaughter the animals that we eat. We are no longer reminded of that. I read this week in an article that a, uh, a group, uh, a, a radical group, I would say, fringe group, let's just put it this way, fringe group, put on the package of meat 
the name of the cow or the name of the steer that was being eaten and the life that this, this steer lived. Enjoy your food. And it caused all kinds of waves because we don't think that way. We don't think that death requires something. But I was really fascinated to understand as I'm reading and uh, enjoying uh, an amazing book, is that the whole science and medical profession is not interested in solving our problems of sickness and disease. That is something that is being done on the way to something far greater. It is the thought within the scientific and medical community that human beings can live forever. And they are seeking remedies through genetic engineering and everything to allow human beings to live and to live and to live. The solutions to the medical issues are things they discover along the way. Because we are convinced that life doesn't have to be about death. Good people of Napoleon, Lent is about facing death. It is about going with Jesus to Jerusalem where he dies. Lent is a time to intensify our resolve to be vaccinated from the curse of Adam by more fully engaging in the disciplines. If you think about it, the disciplines we're called to in Lent, to pray, to fast, and to give charity. They're really symbols of death. You know, as you face death, you no longer require sustenance to eat. As you face death, you draw closer to the eternal world, and you're less concerned about the world that you're leaving. And as you face death, you understand that you will leave everything behind. It is not yours. To pray or to fast, to pray and to give are the disciplines of Lent that speak to us being unafraid of death because of what Jesus does for us. I call us into that week and that season of Lent to fully embrace it and to embrace the remedy to what Adam has done. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. Allow us to hear them. Allow us to be challenged. Help us to think the things we need to think. To dwell on the things we need to dwell on. And to arrange our lives in response to your grace and to the power of your Spirit that we might live lives that truly honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.
would you join me in our responsive prayer of confession? This we have come to know. This is what we believe. The Eternal One is an everlasting God, creator of heaven and earth, who does not grow weary or faint, whose mercy is new every morning, whose compassion never fails us, whose faithfulness never ends, who is beyond all understanding, whose wisdom is unsearchable, whose splendor is unspeakable, whose power is unshakable, whose purposes are unstoppable, who is the purpose and meaning of life for us, whose plans involve us, whose spirit forms and shapes us, whose sacrifice saves us, whose care embraces us, whose grace strengthens us, whose love transforms us, whose inheritance certainly awaits us. This we have come to know. This is what we believe. Amen. You may be seated. We'll receive our offering at this time. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> I invite you now to the table of the Lord. It is a special table in this season of Lent. It is a table in which we know that in this final week of Jesus' life, he shared with his disciples. It is a table that calls us into full fellowship and obedience to him. So join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, so that renewed in the gift of your Spirit, we may come into the fullness of your grace. And so with all of the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. As we prepare our communion this morning, I would invite you to sing the first verse of Just As I Am and our communion servers, if you would, please come forward.
Jesus entered into a world that was broken, a world that was suffering and full of grief. He grieved the loss of his friends. He wept for his people. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He entered into a weary world in desperate need of hope and peace, a world crying out for God's everlasting presence and love. On his darkest nights, amid fragments of betrayal, abandonment, denial, accusation, mistreatment, and suffering, Jesus gathered his disciples for one final meal together. Amid all the brokenness and failure, he offered hope and promise, promise of God's blessing to them through a new covenant celebrated with bread and with wine. He took the bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he also took a cup saying, this cup is a new covenant that is sealed in my blood. It is a blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time that you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving death and the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord until he comes. And therefore we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this covenant. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Our table is now open.
the body of Christ given to you. blood of Jesus shed for you. Amen. Would you join me in the acclamation? Praise the Lord my soul. Praise the Lord, my soul, who forgives all of your sins, who redeems your life from the pit. Let us pray. Lord God, in deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we've shared in the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. So Lord, may we live to your glory, both as inhabitants of earth and citizens of the commonwealth and kingdom of heaven. Amen.
of things you need to know about and to pray for. <clears throat> we have a message here from someone I don't know, but a son who has been diagnosed with early stage of kidney cancer. Um, I'm not sure who that is, but that's the request. Also, um, you may not be aware of this, but uh, Ben Reese was uh, t uh, taken to the hospital uh, early this week and then transferred to Toledo Hospital in critical care. He is still in ICU, um, but he is doing better. Uh, I talked to Sarah last night. Um, he is partially breathing on his own. I think he's up to about, she said, 50% breathing on his own. The rest is done by a respirator. They do have his kidneys functioning again and uh, some other things. He is not out of the woods. Uh, it's, it's been a very, very serious uh, thing for him. And, uh, but it looks encouraging. The signs at least seem to be pointing in an encouraging direction. So if you would keep Ben in your prayers and his family in your prayers, I know that they would uh, appreciate it. Um, and we will seek to keep uh, you updated on that. Um, I am sure that there are other requests this morning, but rather than go into those, I trust those to you in your prayer time. Remember to pray for your secret uh, prayer partner that you have teamed up with. They need it, all right? They need it. You may not, but they do. And um, so please, please do that. So let me bless you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May you be a people who see the remedy to our world's issues in the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace, for we are. The Bible.